Welcome back to AP Chemistry. I'm Jeremy Krug. And in this video of my complete AP Chemistry course, we're looking at covalent bonds. Now, if you're interested in ionic bonds, you might want to look at the last video. But here, we're focusing on covalent bonds. Now, covalent bonds are produced when two nonmetals share electrons. Now, the key part of this, there are actually two, there are two nonmetals, so you're not going to see a, 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 a metal like sodium or potassium participating in a covalent bond, and they're also sharing electrons. Very important there, because we're not talking about a transfer of electrons like we had with ionic bonds, or a donating, or giving up electrons, or stealing them, or taking them. They're actually sharing them. So that's an important thing to remember. So an example here might be with these two nonmetals. We have iodine and we also have chlorine. Now I've, I've drawn these in such a way so that their uh, valence electrons are very obvious to see. This is something called a Lewis electron dot diagram, or it's just sometimes called a Lewis diagram for short. I have written the symbol for iodine and the periodic table shows us that since it's in group 17, it has seven valence electrons. So I've positioned these seven valence electrons around the iodine atom. I've done the same thing for chlorine. It has seven valence electrons as well. So I've positioned those around the uh, chlorine atom in a similar fashion. Well, when these two atoms get together, they're going to actually share the lone electron they have there. They're actually going to get together and they will share these two electrons and that's going to be or form a covalent bond. So when they're far apart like this we have that higher potential energy state like we talked about in the last video and when they get closer to each other and they form that bond now they're going to have a lower potential energy state once that bond is formed. And those two electrons will make a bond and so we have our molecule of iodine monochloride that is shown here in this Lewis electron dot diagram. Now there are actually two types of covalent bonds. I want to focus on that for a second here. We can have a, a case like this, iodine and sulfur, and for clarity's sake I have omitted the uh, extra valence electrons. I know iodine has seven and sulfur has six, but I'm just focusing on these two that are going to be bonding, just to keep things clear. And we know that iodine and sulfur are both nonmetals, and so they can they can share these two electrons between them. And as it turns out, iodine and sulfur will both share that electron pair fairly equally. They're fairly equitable in that sharing uh, relationship there. This is something called a nonpolar covalent bond. And when we say nonpolar bond, we're saying that these two nonmetals will share the electrons equally. So that's, that's an important part of this here, that they're going to be sharing those electrons equally or almost equally. Now, what that means is these two electrons are probably going to be, you know, fairly equidistant between the two atoms there. And so sulfur will get to use these, you know, about half the time. And iodine will get to use these electrons about half the time. And so it's a fairly equitable sharing relationship. Now that is contrasted with a different type of covalent bond. And that would be one that's exemplified here. We have carbon and fluorine. But carbon and fluorine don't share quite as well. In fact, one of them is hogging the electrons. This is an unequal sharing arrangement. This is something we call a polar covalent bond. And this is the type of covalent bond where these two nonmetals are sharing their electrons, but they're doing so, as we can see here, unequally. Unequally. And so one of the atoms is actually hogging the electrons. And so what's going to happen is that you know, these two electrons will have a covalent bond that they will be shared, but fluorine is known as a notorious electron hog. And so fluorine is going to be hogging these electrons over here. You know, it's going to be taking those electrons almost all the time. And so carbon hardly ever gets to use those electrons. You know, carbon is, is sad over here because it hardly gets to use those electrons. This is a very unequal sharing relationship. It's a polar bond. There's a pole here. You know, it's like one of those 
electrons or those atoms is hogging those electrons, this side tends to be kind of negative because those electrons are over there all the time. This side is kind of positive. So we have these two types of bonds, nonpolar and polar. Now this raises the question, how do we know? How do we know that, for example, the iodine and the sulfur, somehow I was able to predict that that was going to be nonpolar, but that the carbon and fluorine would make a polar covalent bond? How did I know that? Well, it actually comes down to the electronegativities of these nonmetals. And so here is a partial electronegativity chart. This includes uh, the nonmetals, the most common nonmetals that we deal with. Uh, in this course. And what we have to do is measure or calculate the difference between the two atoms' electronegativities. So if we do that and we find that the difference in the two atoms' electronegativities is less than about 0.5, that means it's a nonpolar covalent bond, that they're sharing their electrons pretty much equally or almost equally. If you have a case where the difference in the electronegativities is greater than 0.5, or it's equal to 0.5, we can call that polar covalent. So this is kind of a, uh, a way of telling if a bond is polar or nonpolar. And of course, if you ever have a case where it's just a metal and a nonmetal, well, we don't have to worry about polar or nonpolar business at all. It's just ionic. So let's try a few examples here. So let's say we have boron and chlorine. Well, we know that the boron and chlorine are both nonmetals, so let's look at their electronegativities. Boron is about 2.0, and chlorine is, right here, it's about 3.0. So it seems like the difference between these two is 1.0, and that's certainly greater than or equal to 0.5. So we're going to call this a polar covalent bond. And by the way, the one that has the greater electronegativity is the one that's hogging the electrons. And so we'd say that chlorine is the one that's hogging those electrons in this polar covalent bond. It would, be, it would have that partial negative side if we're looking at the, the partial charges in this bond. How about carbon and hydrogen? Well, we can see that carbon and hydrogen are both nonmetals, so let's look at the electronegativities. Carbon is 2.5, and hydrogen is 2.1. So the difference between these two is much less. It's about 0 0.4. And so as a result, we can say that this is a nonpolar covalent bond. There's not much tug at all. If there is at all, it would be toward carbon because it's more electronegative, but it's really not tugging much at all. This is a fairly nonpolar bond, as we can see. Let's try one more example, sodium and bromine. Well, if we look at the periodic table, we can see that although, although bromine is a nonmetal, sodium is a metal. So this is a metal and a nonmetal, so that would make this an ionic bond. We don't even have to worry about the electronegativity here. Well, I hope through this video you've been able to learn something about ionic bonding and covalent bonding, and particularly covalent bonding in this video, and how we can predict uh, the, the type of bond that we're going to have. If you learned something or if you enjoyed the video, please smash that like button, give me a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to my channel already, please hit that subscribe button so you won't uh, miss out on any of my videos in this complete AP Chemistry uh, course online. Um, I hope to see you again on my channel again very soon where we can learn some more chemistry together.